sort of one word as a starting point in discussing romantic music. I mean, some what you think is one of the main ingredients for romantic music. Yeah. Emotionalism. Emotionalism. Okay, what do we get from that? Yeah, no, I mean, is there, uh, is there any pro or con? Personally, emotional. Right, right. I think this is, this is the important part of it. You see, the subjective emotion, as opposed to the mass emotion of a great event of some sort, you see, something that concerns only the poet or the, the, the writer, uh, the feeling person. So, but emotionalism is right. What else? I would say that it couples the individual, and individualism raised Yeah, now, now this is the main point, huh? You see, I mean, the expression of each person's, so to speak, private feelings, rather than the mass feeling of a descriptive form, like, like an oratorio or something like that, or, or something that is framed into a big form. It's a breakthrough into a personal feeling where even the form, very often, of course, is broken up. You see, there, there we might come towards another very important point, which is what? Concerning the forms of, of most romantic works, yeah. Well, in romantic pieces, there is more emphasis on, on shorter pieces, and there are a lot of new forms, more you throw in instrumental pieces, but there are we have program music coming through, we have, you know, the ballads and sort of thing that it is handy for. And this is like short pieces rather than a formal kind of music. Right. You see that the normalcy is the expression rather in a free, shorter form. And the form so many of them did struggle with is the standard sonata. They struggled out of various reasons. Some people hold the opinion that they couldn't write them. And others, of course, say that they wanted to rattle the chains there and free that form to a certain extent. Which is right. I mean, we finally can say that the Schumann sonatas are badly written, or that the Chopin sonatas are badly written. And I don't think anyone would ever excuse Mendel, uh, accuse Mendelssohn of not being able to write these in forms, because he certainly could. But the other masters did did their own experimenting, like as you might recall in the first movement of a Chopin B flat minor sonata, no standard recapitulation, but after the development they're jumping straight into the second scene and things like that. In uh, Schumann, odd combinations of uh, things like in the in the Opus 11 in the F sharp minor sonata, the last movement. That is almost a like like a group of small pieces A B C D E and then over again that's the same cycle and then a coda so there are this does not mean they couldn't have written a decent sonata form because Schumann did it in his Opus 22 sonata which musically is not as great and as free as the other one but it's a very very good normal sonata form and. I would say that uh, Chopin in his three minor sonata writes a gigantic sonata, one that also is completely convincing. Besides that, so many of them, of course, were coming from an experimental end, a virtuoso side, which also is different, I think. Now, so the short forms, the preponderance of short forms, and a trend towards them, and a trend towards program music which was handled by each one in his own individual way. Of course, we know that program music is at least 150 years older than uh, those masters. I mean, we find family in Cooper and whole lists of pieces that all have titles, some of whom we don't even quite know what he means anymore. But uh, even so, they have titles, and uh, since then many other things have been done with titles. They all used a certain amount of uh, indications as to what he meant, where I would say the emphasis nevertheless is never on the purely descriptive side, but on the emotions that are, so to speak, kindled 
within the composer. So when he says in the pastoral symphony, on the first movement, Erwachen, Eitere Empfindungen, the awakening of uh, pleasant feelings upon arrival in the country. We do not hear the cowbells and the, uh, the trumpet of the, of the coachman and so on, but we have a wonderful relaxed feeling. He goes a little bit farther later on, and he may imitate some birds' voices, but this just, just takes, takes a couple of bars. Otherwise, he walks along the, the river in a, in a very happy-go-lucky way. The thunderstorm, of course, you can stylize. I mean, there you make notice. In a way, there, of course, we again come to the uh, impossibly difficult problem. Where is the vertical line that separates the classics from the romantics? I just don't believe that this will last much longer. I would say the framing in of the old so-called romantic period itself is quite problematic and has probably changed in my lifetime considerably. Because when I was a youngster, of course, Hugo Wolf and people like that were considered marvelous. I mean, it's, uh, they, they were new. Richard Strauss was the latest. The, the Art Arnolds, well, some people laughed at them, some didn't even bother laughing at them. So the, uh, this all, of course, has changed now quite much, and uh, I, would be, I would be a little bit at a loss to say where is the termination of the romantic school. See, to me, if I would be forced to find some reason for, the, for, for setting them there, I would say they are framed by two gigantic, gigantic columns, and the one is Schubert on the one end, and the other is Brahms on the other. Because Brahms indicates two trends. The one is reverting to a certain classicism, which isn't necessarily a neoclassicism yet, but there is a trend away from, from purely romantic music in many of his larger works. And then, of course, there is a, an intimacy of finesse of feeling, in, let's say, in, in his songs, in his small piano works, which goes even a degree deeper because it's an almost, an almost psychoanalytical finesse that is so intimate that it's sometimes almost bores the embarrassing, like reading private love letters or so, where you, well, you enjoy being a little nosy, but then you think, I don't know, maybe I should leave those people alone without, without interfering there. So this, to me, would, would be the, the cornerstones of, the, of the, what, we, what we could call the high romantic period. Not that the romantic composers don't go into our days still, you see. The, a, few, a few points have not been brought up yet, a characteristic of almost all romantic composers. Extremely literate. They were extremely well read, very interested in any form of uh, contemporary literature, old literature, musical research, and so on. So they were in that respect probably more cosmopolitan than, uh, than the masters before them. Most of them also did some political thing, which up to then you don't see too much mm -hmm. of. I mean, all right, so Beethoven got angry at, at, at these aristocrats occasionally and so on. But here, of course, we have cases of real exposure, I mean, including, including Richard Wagner, who uh, definitely was a uh, free thinker and went with the revolutionary movements quite strong. So did Schumann to a certain extent. So we find that there is a, a somewhat wider horizon that, of course, the, their, their backgrounds usually were some, uh, from, on, on a somewhat higher level he spoke about Mendelssohn being uh, the son of an extremely cultured, well-to-do man. In Schumann's case, he did probably not have quite as much culture 
and not as much money, but even so, it was, it was a very, very normal upper middle class family, there's no doubt about. And uh, this, I think, set them off slightly differently, too. Now, another thing, of course, about the romantic composers, in spite of their own personal romanticism and expression of personalized feelings, is that they were immensely interested in old music, in a way, more than the classical forces were. They reached back to Bach much stronger and with much more longing and much more understanding than the 50 years before. And they felt they needed it, probably as sort of an antidote against getting too vague and too free, because they still would want it to be masters in all their fields. And you find that even in Schumann, a great amount, fairly strictly counterpuntal writing is done. Even in the songs, strangely enough, if one never thinks so, but it is so. And a few more points. We find, of course, an immense increase in uh, virtuoso style in composing and in the composers being performers and the other way around. I mean, there are some that were gigantic composers and undoubtedly great performers, and others that were gigantic performers and probably rather worthwhile composers. I mean, I, it's very easy to laugh at the Paganini caprices, but in a way, this, this, this is unique. We can't think of, a, of the violin literature without them anymore, just like we can't think of the piano literature without Liszt. Whether we like it or not, that's up to us. I mean, I have my ups and downs. I'm not on the lowest down. I had times where I, 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 got, I just couldn't take any. And right now, once in a while, I think yeah, there is something there. It, uh, whether, whether you find it is as great as he thought it was, <laughs> you see, that's a different story. But even, even his, his uh, arrangements, which he probably meant well, helping the unknown composer, and he himself being the greatest traveling musician and then sitting musician who had everybody come to him like he was the Pope at least. So the, uh, the other point, uh, socially speaking probably, is that most of those masters were pretty well independent. You see, so the, the independence from church and aristocratic influences that way, of course, was in many ways a blessing because they could write whatever they are pleased. Most of them, of course, were active in other fields. Most of them here, as we know, pianists, also conductors. The only one who was definitely not a pianist was the tremendous monstrosity of Richard Wagner lurching in the background of the romantic composers. He couldn't play the piano at all. I mean, he writes uh, one of the very few remarks in, in his uh, autobiographical work. The few, one of the few remarks where he isn't absolutely enchanted with himself. He says uh, his piano teacher told him he will never amount to anything. And he it was right, he still can't play anything on the piano. But I mean, uh, on the few songs of his, we have, of course, a purely piano score. You see, he also didn't like it. He spoke about piano concerto once and says, how can you look off him in the middle of a, of a, of a living uh, group of, of humans? You see, as, as the orchestra lives and the piano is like a coffin. So he didn't particularly approve of it, except as a sort of a receptacle, a musical garbage container where you can throw everything in. Score, scores, and I don't know what all, you know. So this goes somewhat hand in hand with the idea of, of individualistic approach. Only it isn't individualistic in that case, but it's nationalist. And this, I think, is a very important characteristic of the Romantic school. In uh, Germany, of course, the 
the difference may not have been that great because the German uh, literature in music was running very smoothly by then, as you know. Some of the all-time all greats were already completely established or dead. So there came another, another bunch with a slightly different musical trend. But the, the trend towards being German masters, of course, was very strong in all of them, including the Adjikwik Mendels, who changed back and forth due to political inclinations of the, of the last century. Well, originally, of course, he was as German as any other ever. And so was Schumann. The influence in, in the other nations, probably, of all the trend towards nationalistic music was the reaction against the German music, see, which caused, of course, the early Russians, Glinka, Dalgomirsky, Bahadirev, and so on, to start with their own ideas of what music should be, very much from the, from the source of folk music. It started on the other side with Berlioz trying to emancipate himself as much as he could from the, from the influence of the preceding masters and being a tremendous influence on the later composers himself that influenced in a way Chopin listening to his own country for inspiration and of course there we have a great amount of, of his works that are completely nationally inclined. I mean, we only hear the name Mazurka or Polonaise, we don't need much more than that. And the greater works gradually, of course, widened and uh, lived much farther. And I think if he had lived longer, he would have probably been a little bit less fenced in in, in, this, in this form. I might in that connection mention that for our field, all we have to know is that there are a few little songs for, for voice and piano that are actually nothing else but little slow balls, mazurka style, style pieces, very pretty and uh, not too usable there. They try to make some arrangements of it even for coloratura, where the coloratura sings the piano interlude that is much more interesting than the song itself. So we, we sadly enough, do not have anything about him, but as an influence, of course, we have to consider him one of the great influences in music history. We forget him sometimes, because his influence towards the romanticism of Liszt and Wagner, and oddly enough, on the other side also, uh, Brahms was immense. It's like a, like a, a center that led in, in both directions. The masters had great understanding for each other, and sometimes one can't understand how they did it. So, I mean, there are certain pieces where really you think, well, that uh, is not clear how different they can be. I mean, for instance, Berlioz was adored by Schumann and absolutely despised by Mendels. Of course, it's not too illogical. Schumann, as the much freer and much more experimental composer, felt that there's another guy groping around for something. Well, Mendelssohn has a wonderful and orderly and, and uh, neat uh, composer there, felt that, uh, that this guy, uh, he insisted that there was not a spark of talent, and that is such a tragedy, because he's, he's so nice, and he knows so much about music, and his judgments are so good, and then he writes absolutely horrible music. Everything is horrible. Not one good note he leaves, he leaves there. You see, he's disgusted with the idea of program music itself, but the main thing is that, that he says that, all right, if it, if it would make any musical sense, I would, uh, I would accept it, but it doesn't. There's nothing there. So, I mean, we find misunderstanding between them. I mean, Stuart Schumann was always an adorer of Mendelssohn. This never changed. Mendelssohn and Schumann mostly very good, sometimes not. I mean, Chopin did not have any, anything against the other two, 
Well, uh, Schumann occasionally got stuck in misunderstandings so time quite badly. I think I mentioned that it was so completely helpless about the B-flat minor sonata. This is like taking four completely different horses and putting them together and then letting them move forward and they all pull apart. And that he called a sonata. And he should have written a nice adultery instead of the funeral march. <laughs> and the last movement is nothing. And so on. So there he blanked out completely, which is very strange. And in Schumann's case, I would I would say I absolutely am convinced that it was never in any form malicious. Because it was a deeply humble and honest man. There's no doubt about it. So was Mendelssohn in that respect. Chopin occasionally let loose on, on uh, certain meannesses in his letters because he was probably more of a sport brat than the other two, as a young girl too also, and babied by everyone, including his, his society group there in, in, in Paris. <laughs>